Hey guys, welcome back to the Learn to Play series. Today we're going to close out the Enemy Action Kharkov series with the German solo module. Once again, designer John Butterfield will be doing the teach, and this time it's a little different as John talks through more of the decisions he's making for each individual unit. I think you'll find this similar to a playthrough in many ways. So sit back, grab your favorite beverage, and enjoy the final Learn to Play session for Enemy Action Kharkov. Over to you, John. Thanks, Mo. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here for this third session of Enemy Action Kharkov, where we'll be focusing on the German solo game. We'll try to play through one entire game turn. I'm going to assume that you're familiar with the basic concepts of the two-player game, that you have an understanding of how to play the live player side, in this case, the German side. If you aren't familiar with it or need a refresher, you might want to go check out the learn to play video that Mo and I made for the two-player game, which introduces the basic rules of play for enemy action Kharkov. So I'll be playing on this Vassal module of the German solo game. That's what you're seeing here. The units are in their initial positions. The Soviet units of the Voronezh front are here. They're kind of the or light orange color and the Soviet units of the Southwest front are the darker orange, reddish color. There's two Soviet fronts. Before starting, I wanted to go over some of the features that are unique to the German solo game. The map is oriented with a front line of units near the upper edge, the eastern edge. Villages appear on the map. That's these little squares. That's only in this game. They're used primarily for placement of Soviet garrison markers, another feature unique to this game, and uh, which are small forces protecting Soviet gains and Soviet flanks. Uh, just like in the two-player game, they're, all cities and towns are VP hexes. In this game, they're marked for one front or the other. So a light orange colored village or a light orange outline around a town indicates that that, that is targeted for the Voronezh front. And if it's the reddish color, it's targeted for the southwest front and those fronts will favor going towards those. Some of them are targeted by both, where I'm indicating here there's a village and here there's a, a, a VP town where, where both colors are shown. Now, also Soviet movement arrows are printed on this map. Sometimes Soviet units follow these arrows when moving, though many other factors direct their movement as well. So a large arrowhead indicates a primary movement direction, whereas the Narrow pointers indicate a secondary direction. The, the primary direction will be favored. Some hexes are shaded. You see these shaded pink hexes here. These are logistics hexes for the southwest front and over here for the Bronis front. As the Soviets advance, they'll prioritize clearing the road net running through these areas, uh, which are crucial for Soviet supply uh, for forward units. So they don't want the German units in there. And as in the two-player game, there are dotted lines on the map that indicate the Soviet artillery barrage line, the Soviet support line, and then there's a third one in German solo only, which is the uh, operational limit. And Soviet units will tend not to cross this line unless there's a real opportunity to grab a victory hex so that that's a new feature in the German solo game. As in the two-player game, German and Soviet reserves are available. For example, these are the reserve units for the Germans, and they have some eliminated units already, which I'll get to in a moment. And in the two-player game, reserve units enter by playing a reserve command, and that'll be the case for the German player. But for the Soviets, the reserves will enter as a function of combat or um, movement action. So it's, a, it's different in the solo game. So as in two player, the Germans will start with a hand of cards. They start with four cards. There is no Soviet hand. The Soviet enemy command cards are drawn from a deck. I'm showing that over here. They're drawn two at a time, and then they're compared to determine uh, which Soviet command card is used. And I'll go into that more as we get into play. You'll notice there are already some cards in the Soviet discard pile, which will bring me to my next feature uh, that's specific to the solo game, uh, that is the German solo game. 
Those of you familiar with the two-player game may note that the front line looks a little bit different. There's already a hole in this area. So that is because the German solo game starts right after the initial Soviet attack. While you're setting up, this is what the front line looks like initially, but there are one of five different randomly selected attacks takes place. And in order to reflect that, you're directed to shift some units locations, to uh, remove some steps, even to eliminate some units, and to discard certain Soviet cards to indicate they've been played. So after the setup adjustments are made, this is what the screen is looking like, the, the, the map. There's, there's a gap here on the line because what happened in initial setup, mobile group Popov made some attacks in the first, represents attacks they made in the first Soviet turn. And so uh, they've advanced some. That's why there are two units of core Rouse in the eliminated units box and why there are cards in the Soviet discard pile. So every game, there's a different, one of five different Soviet initial attacks, which is creating one of five different challenges that you as a German player will face uh, when you take your first turn, which is uh, happening now. So with that introduction to the features and the setup of the German solo game, let's get started. Oh, I also wanted to point out that the there are objective markers for the Soviets that are also placed in that, those initial setup adjustments. So this objective marker is where the Southwest Front might tend to move toward, and this one where the Veronish Front units might, might tend to move. Uh, these objective markers are specific to uh, the 40th Army and the 1st Guards Army on the flanks of the Soviet offensive. So, as I said, the Soviets have already taken their first turn via setup adjustment. So now it's the German first turn. So I'm going to look at my hand and I've got to do something to deal with this gap here because uh, I don't know which Soviet units will be moving next. It'll all depend on card draw. So I'm going to play a card to start to deal with that issue. So my first card play is going to be this third core primary card uh, from, the, from the German hand. So as in the two-player game, I have my choice of any of the commands here. There's a, there's a command to deploy all third core reserves. I don't have any. There's a choice to activate all units third core. That's what I'm going to be doing. The third choice is only active starting on turn three. That's to get replacements. And the fourth choice is a, is a special command to activate any one unit on your side. But as you know from the two-player game, that's something you can only do once per turn. So you want to use that as a kind of a last resort thing. Okay, so I'm going to move my guys here in third core. They, they're the ones with the red band on the top. I'm going to take this armor unit and he can move six. He's not in his zone of control. So he's going to go one, two, three, along the road, four, five, six. He's going to go right there to, to try to protect my flank from this, this uh, potential breakthrough here. I'm going to take the guy out of the city here. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. So he's there, but I want to defend the city. So I'm going to move the infantry unit into Slavyansk. So I still hold the city. And then this last guy is going to stay put, but I'm going to put an, an improved position on him so that he is stronger defensively. There we go. So that's starts to not completely close the gap, but it's a start. So that was my first German turn. So now I discard my card. And so now it's time for the Soviet impulse. So in the German solo game, when it's the Soviet turn, you draw two Soviet cards from the Soviet deck. I'm going to pull the two that I draw right out onto the map to show you. I drew Soviet 6th Army, a primary card, and I drew 40th Army. And I'm going to pick one as the command based on which one is primary. That's the first kind of tiebreaker. So there's only one primary card. So we will be picking 6th Army as 
our active card for this turn. Now, what happens to the 40th Army card? It's not discarded. It goes down here into this box called Soviet Auxiliary Cards. And uh, it sits there and it may come into play later in the turn, or it may itself become a, a, an activation card, but we'll find out about that later. So now Sixth Army is the card we're using. And in the solo game, when you're looking at the other side's cards, you read the commands and do the first one that, uh, that applies. Actually, I did want to point out one other thing about this auxiliary card. When you put it in its box, and I, I forgot this, but you check it to see if it has an event, a regular event that's valid on the current game turn. And if it does, you immediately implement that event and discard the card and then go back to using your primary, your selected card for its activation. But in this case, this 40th Army card does not have a valid event. The, the, the first event shown here is a special event, only available on turn 9 or 10. So that's not selected. Then the other event listed is the fourth line, is an event that's only good on turn 5 or later. So in this case, there's no event this card can be played for. So it remains in the box. Okay, back to 6th Army. They're going to activate. So in the... Soviet solo game, when the Soviet activation occurs, there's an activation sequence that you follow, and it's uh, summarized on the play aid, and I'm going to walk through that now. The first thing you do is to check to see if any Soviet units are proximate to the objective marker for their front. So the 6th Army units are in this area, to see if any of these could put, move right now, if, if they would be able to move and enter the Southwest Front objective. But it doesn't look like any units can do that because German zones of control would block that. A unit, let's say this, this unit were moving, one, two, three, he'd have to stop there. If that German unit wasn't there, he could go four, five, six and reach the objective. And if that were the case, what that means is that we would we would actually relocate the objective to a more distant, a more distant target. But no one can reach that objective now, so we don't do that. Then the next part of the activation is to move active units. And there's a set of movement method priorities we follow. So again, we're looking at these units here. These five units make up the 6th Army. So they are the ones that, and only them, are the ones eligible to move at this point. So the, there's a sequence of movement methods. The first one says, if the unit can enter a VP hex, do so. Well, there is no VP hex they can actually enter. They already occupy a VP hex here. I'll show you that. So that's already Soviet-controlled. There's another one over here that's Soviet-controlled already. Uh, but they can't actually reach another VPX, so they don't do that. Then it says move adjacent to a German VPX and closer to the objective. So if a unit here would be able to, given its movement allowance, move adjacent to a, a German VPX and closer to the objective, it would do so. The objective is, is here again, and in order to move closer to it, we check our units, and the units are checked in ascending numerical order. You'll notice on the bottom of each unit, I'm just going to move, move that aside. I'll put it back in a moment. We have units with, with selector numbers, 3, 4, 8, 7, and 21. So the lowest numbered one is 3. So let me put these back here. So we check unit three first. Can it move adjacent to a VP hex? Can it, for example, reach this VP hex, which is close to the objective? It has a movement allowance of four, but it's adjacent to a German unit, so it'll cost one to leave that zone of control, an infantry unit. So he could go, can cross the river with no additional cost. So that's two to there, three, four to there, because that's a a forest. So he, he doesn't have enough movement points, let's see, one, two, three, four, to actually get adjacent. So he's not going to move by that method. 
However, the other units probably do. So the next unit in numerical order is unit four. So he could move closer. He's right now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hexes away from the objective. Whereas the hexes adjacent to this VP hex are only one, two, four away or five away. So any of those hexes that he could move to that are adjacent to um, Isium would qualify for this movement method. So he's going to go one, two, three, four. Okay, because that's the adjacent to a unit and uh, there's some priorities. It, it's actually closest to the objective. It's only four away. So that's the one that would prefer. Okay. There are also adjustments you might make to a unit's move, a Soviet unit's move, when it moves adjacent to an enemy unit. There are adjustments intended to create more favorable attack situations by spreading your units out. But in this case, the, the first priority when you're moving adjacent to an enemy is to cause surround of the unit. And that is what this move does. It actually surrounds the German unit in the hex. So that is definitely where this guy's going to go because it's, it's the best move that ends adjacent uh, to the hex. So then let's check other active units by this method, unit seven will also be able to move closer to the objective and adjacent to the same VP hex. So it will move over here. It has a choice of moving actually to any of these three it could reach. Now, because it's moving adjacent to an enemy unit, we, we check the preferences when you move adjacent to an enemy unit. And the unit's already surrounded, so that's not a priority. It would want to enter a hex that's not adjacent to a Soviet unit, but there aren't any, or that's not occupied by an active unit. This unit is active, the others aren't. That unit is going to move one, two, three, four to this hex because uh, it can reach it and it's not occupied by an active unit. It couldn't move here because this is already occupied by five steps and entering that hex would, would be an overstack because you can't have more than six steps in a hex. Okay, now unit eight is going to move and he's going to wind up here because there are no preferences for moving adjacent enemy units that will, that will affect this move. And so the movement method of moving closer to the front then is in effect. So that's the hex that's closest to the front objective, I mean. And then finally, this guy could move, and he can move to a hex adjacent to the guy in Isium that is not occupied by an active unit because he only has one step. He lost a step in the initial setup process. So he's moving here. This, this hex now has six steps, so he could fit there, and he's stacking with inactive units, which is uh, one of the preferences for when you're moving adjacent to an enemy. So all those guys move by this movement method, the second movement method, to get adjacent to uh, German-occupied VPX. Now, we still have one unit left who hasn't moved yet, so we're going to check the remaining movement methods. Method three is to open a supply line, but that's not an issue yet because the Soviets are in supply. And then the next method is to cause surround. That is to move to a hex that would result in a German unit that's not surrounded becoming surrounded. So he can do that. He can go one, two, leaving a Zoc as one extra movement point, three, and surround this unit. So that's the move made by uh, this unit of the Sixth Army. Now, he left a Soviet VP hex empty. But that's okay because no German unit is proximate to it. Even though he's adjacent, he can't enter it because you can't go Zok to Zok if he was moving. So the Soviet VP hex is, is uh, not under threat of being occupied by a German unit. So this move is allowed. So that concludes the movement part 
of the activation. So we go on to the next part of the activation, which is to check to see if any attacks are conducted. We check each incidence of where an active unit is adjacent to an enemy unit to see if there might be an attack. And we do that again in the selector order, ascending selector order. So the first, that the lowest number of unit is again, this unit 03. So we're going to check him first to see if he will attack this adjacent German unit. So there's a process where you compare strength in the attack. It's called an attack check. And so our Soviet unit strength is four and the German unit strength is three. We check to see if there's any adjustments to that just for the purpose of making the check. And there's a, a list of adjustments such as if, if this if the German defender had an improved position or was adjacent to another supply German unit or was across a river or was dispersed or was out of supply, none of which apply. Even though a unit surrounded doesn't mean it's out of supply because supply is checked and determined only at the start of the game turn. So right now, this is a one to one. It, we create a ratio like you would when you're resolving combat. And so uh, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. And it says if the ratio is three to one or higher, an attack occurs. If it's less than one-to-one, -one, no attack occurs. And if it's between one-to-one -one and three-to-one, uh, you, you add up the tactical value of the attack. If you can get a tactical value of seven, and I'm going to go through a list, the attack will then occur. So we look at, these are the factors in the tactical value. We look at the, co the command card that was played. It has a command value here. It's, it has a command value of two. So that's added to the tactical value. So we have two so far. We get to add two to the tactical value if the strength ratio is two to one or better. It is not. We get to add one to the value if the Soviet artillery barrage bonus applies, and it does. If you recall from the two-player game, all Soviet attacks in turns one and two that are east of this line here, this dotted line, will benefit from a free artillery tactic in every combat. So that will affect the tactical value. It will add one, so our tactical value is now up to three. Then we get one if the attack is in Soviet support. At the start of the game and for the first five turns, all attacks are in Soviet support. So now we're up to four. We get one tactical value if the Soviets have armor. They do not, they're just infantry. We'll get one tactical value if, if any of the attacking units are surrounded because they're desperate, but that's not the case. We get a plus one if flanking applies. That is, if there are if there are attackers in hexes that are adjacent to the defender but not adjacent to each other. There aren't. There's only an attack from one hex. Uh, these units over here are not active. And if the target is in a VP hex, it is not. So there's no tactical value for attacking a VP hex because it's not. Then if there's a combat tactic on the auxiliary card, this was where the auxiliary card starts to come in, that applies to the attack, it would be considered. Now the auxiliary card has on it artillery. Now this attack already benefits from artillery because of the artillery uh, barrage zone. So this, this card would not apply. So that does not add to the tactical value. And that's it. So our total tactical value was one, two, three, four, which is not enough to trigger the attack. It'd have to be seven or higher. So that attack is not is seen as not a good attack by the Soviets, so they will not do it. So now we check the next unit in ascending selector order, and that is this unit here, which is 04. And when you're doing an attack check, you include that unit and all other active units adjacent to the same enemy hex in the calculation for whether an attack will occur. So we have a strength of three plus four is seven. 
eight from this stack, the I mean, just one from this stack, the 11 are not active. And here we have three active. So that's a total of three, four, five, six, seven, 11 to three, which is a three to one. So the attack will happen. We don't have to do the tactical value part of the check because if it's three to one or higher, the attack occurs. Now we resolve that attack. So going to the combat procedure for the Soviet side, we start the combat procedure by checking to see if there's any reserve units that are active. That would mean if, if there's any sixth army units in the reserve box, they might be added to this attack. So we'll go look at the Soviet reserve box over here. We have a unit in 40th Army and a unit in 1st Guards Army. No one from 6th Army, so no reserves are being added to the attack. We then draw a Soviet card from the deck. This is not the auxiliary card. This is a new draw from the deck. So I'm going to draw a card from the deck, and it is 3rd Tank Army. But when you draw it, as a, you're drawing it as a combat tactic. So you ignore the army part. You just look at the combat tactic. It has two tactics, reinforce battle and artillery. We already are benefiting from artillery, but reinforce battle is a tactic that will be very helpful. I'm going to read what reinforce battle does in, a, in an attack by the Soviets. In a Soviet attack, we select an active or inactive on map Soviet unit stack that could reach the combat in a single movement or that is already adjacent to the target to participate in the combat. It's eligible if it's in the same front as the defending or attacking uh, as the attacking unit and didn't move or attack in the current activation. It doesn't have to be active. It just has to be in the same front. If more than one stack qualifies to join the attack, we will pick a stack based on preferences. The first preference is, would adding that stack cause surround? Well, our defender's already surrounded, so no, no, no surround could be caused. The second preference is that it be the stack with the greatest strength that can move to the attack or already starts adjacent to the attack. So looking at the two guys under our one step guy in six army they have a strength of 10 together that's nice this stack here which could possibly reach has a strength of only nine over here we have seven over here there's a three over here there's a four this guy so it looks like the best stack to reinforce would be the two guys under here uh, the five and the five so they are selected to reinforce the battle, which makes this a very strong attack. So that step of the combat procedure resulted in the addition of those units and the application of these combat tactics to the attack. Now, the German player has the option to play a combat tactic. And the German, you don't have that many cards on turn one. So the Germans will not play a combat tactic. So now we are actually going to draw combat chits. There was one other thing we we would do first, though, which is to check to see if our auxiliary card would also be applied as a combat tactic. This is another way the auxiliary card might come into play. But as I said before, the auxiliary card's combat tactic is artillery. And you only apply the auxiliary card's combat tactic is if it's different from from ones already played and would have a benefit, but it's the same, so it will not be applied. Now, we're going to determine how many combat chits we're going to draw. And as in the two-player game, you draw one for each attacking unit with one or two steps and two for every attacking unit with three steps. So we have two units attacking here, so that's uh, two chits, and then in this stack, we have uh, a large unit and two smaller units. So that's four more 
combat ships for a total of six so far. And then this, the one six armor unit here for one more combat ship. So that's seven. And then we have the automatic artillery barrage. So that makes eight. And then our drawn combat, our drawn combat tactic card had two combat tactics, and we get a chip for each one, even though on the drawn card the artillery doesn't add a specific benefit. We still get an extra chip draw in the Soviet solo game. So that's a total of ten combat chips we're drawing. So we're going to go ahead and start drawing them. Now the Soviets. Unlike in the two-player game where you draw chits first based on the number of defending steps and then you choose how many more you want to draw, the Soviets make no such choice. They will draw 10. So the first combat chit says flank attack. Flank attack, that situation does not apply when the defender's in a town. And it's not a, an attack from one hex. We're attacking from three different hexes. So this first marker does not apply. Here's one where that applies if you're in city or the defenders in city or woods, but they're in a town. So this one doesn't apply. They're not in clear or broken either. This one applies if it's a large attack. A Soviet attack is large if at least seven combat chits are drawn. That's the case. The flip side says, oh, if it's a seven to one attack, it's a D2. So let's actually calculate the odds. We didn't do that once we added our reinforcing units. Believe it or not, we're a 21 to three. Yes, we are a 21 to three. It is a seven to one exactly. So that does count, that's big. Here's one that says attacker artillery. Uh, we do have artillery from our barrage. Uh, backside would have been if the defender had artillery. So that applies. German air power. They did not play an air power card. Neither did the Soviets apply an air power tactic. That doesn't apply. Here's another artillery. So that's good for the Soviets, bad for the Germans. Here's a four to one, which would be a hit on a four to one or greater. That would apply. The backside says less than three to one. That does not apply. So it's a four to one. Uh, here's another four to one. So not two to one, it's four to one. Now that side, this side, the P means this side has priority if they both would apply. Only attacker armor. Yes, only we have armor. This says it applies on game turns one through eight, which it is. Uh, the flip side said only defender armor, but that's not the case. And oh my, here's another seven to one. And the back side said five to one. So seven to one. So this attack it looks like it's been very successful. The total number of hits to the defender are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That is indeed a lot. Now, one hit is absorbed by the town, so it's a D8, but this is nonetheless way more than is required to el eliminate the unit. The unit would lose one step, has, has two steps. If, even if it retreated, like this, because it retreats through a Zoc, it has to take a step. And then it could retreat a, a second hex for two hits. And then it's eliminated on the third hit because it can only retreat two hexes. So after three hits, the unit is eliminated, eliminated units box. Okay, now in the German solo game, if a Soviet attack eliminates the defender, and there are defender steps that were left unfulfilled, that actually reduces the amount of attacker hits. So in this case, there were eight hits that had to be fulfilled. Only three were fulfilled, so only three were used to eliminate the unit. So five hits were kind of unused. This A1 result here on this chip will not be applied because it is it is more than compensated for by the excess hits against the defender. So the outcome of this attack was that the defender was eliminated and the Soviets took no losses. So now we do advance after combat. Now the units that reinforced are restricted in that they cannot advance after combat. So 
the guys in Papa that participated in the attack will have to stay where they are. So only the infantry of Sixth Army will be advancing. And we checked for advance again in selector order. So our lowest selector uh, sending order would be that four unit. So there's a uh, priority for advancing or to determine whether or not Soviet units advance. So if the combat hex is empty and it's a VP hex, the unit automatically advances. So that happens. Unit 04 moves into Isium and that becomes now a Soviet VP. So we're going to go down to the VP track and advance the VP marker one. The Soviets started with uh, two VPs for the two towns they already control. And now they just took control of the third one. Now we can check for other units to advance. The next numbered unit is unit o of the active units is 07. And he will advance now that this is a Soviet VP hex, it's no longer high priority target for advance. But another priority for advancing is that it's in the primary direction. And, and you can see here that there's a, a movement arrow pointing into the hex. So, so that's also a priority for advance. However, there's already a unit in the hex. So the unit, the, the advance is not at an automatic. You roll a die. And if you get a one through six, according to our table here, then the unit will advance. And I rolled a nine. So the unit declines to advance. But we check other units as well. Unit eight here. Now, he'd be advancing not in a primary direction. And other reasons he might advance was if it allowed him to cross a river or get close to the objective. But there's nothing compelling about him advancing in that direction. So there's nothing on the list that suggests he should advance. So he will not. Our one strength unit, I'm just going to move these guys over a little bit so we can. Yes, he's got a movement arrow going in. So he's going to try to advance two on a roll of six or less. And he does not either. Okay. So of the four units that could advance, only one did. And that concludes that Soviet attack. The card drawn as a combat tactic is discarded. And then we look at our activation sequence. Attacks are all done. Then if there were active reserves on the map, they might be placed, but we already determined there aren't any. If there are units that didn't move or fight, uh, they might be placed in the reserve box. This is a mechanic that gets Soviet units that are kind of stuck back into reserve where they can have more flexibility, but that's not the case. If there was a unit that didn't move or advance, uh, it might get an improved position, but that's not the case. And there's no dispersed markers to remove from the units. So that's, that's it. That's the end of the first Soviet activation and thus the end of the Soviet impulse. Okay, so now we discard the command card. Now, if there's no card in the auxiliary box at this point, it would be the German turn. However, there is a card in the auxiliary box. It wasn't used for a tactic or an event, so it actually becomes it slides over here and becomes the command card. So the Soviets immediately get to conduct another activation with 40th Army. 40th Army is way over here. Let me move the card over in that vicinity. Okay, so there are two units of 40th Army on the board and there's one unit in the Soviet reserve box. So those units are activated. Now, just checking the card, which I should have done first. The, the first item on the card is a special event that can happen only on turn nine or 10. So that doesn't apply. The second was only starts on turn six. That's to assign replacement. So the third is to activate all units in the army. So that is what happens in this case. So we return to the activation steps to determine what these two units and perhaps the reserve unit will do. This is 40th Army. And as I mentioned in the, in the setup, 40th Army has its own objective, which is sitting here. 
because it's one of the flank armies uh, that its objective is in the town of Belgorod. Likewise, the uh, First Guards Army has its own objective on this flank. So they follow slightly different movement methods. Some are the same. For example, the first thing, after checking to see if they can reach their objective, which they can't at the moment, we then go through the movement methods. The first one is to move into a, v, a German VP hex if they can. But our, our two guys on the map here are, are, are pretty stuck on, uh, on the line right now. The next thing they would do would be to move adjacent to a German unit. Uh, they already are. The, the actual movement method says move to an unoccupied hex, unoccupied hex adjacent to a German unit and not adjacent to a Soviet unit adjacent to the same German unit. So you're moving adjacent to German units, but kind of spreading out at the same time. So neither of those units could actually do that. That is, move to an unoccupied hex that is adjacent to a German unit and not adjacent to a Soviet unit. That's just uh, not possible. So they don't do that. Then the third thing to check is to see if they can move closer to a German unit and closer to their army objective. So you're, you're trying to move toward the German unit that's closest to the active army objective, which is this This is a German unit that's actually closest, but we can't get any closer to him. So we don't move. And then finally, just try to move closer to the front objective, the front objective in this case. And they they can't do that either. They're, they're, they're as close as they can get right now. So they don't do any moving, but that just means we go on to the next uh, step in the activation, which is to do an attack check. They are adjacent to two German units here. They have a strength of eight, but also when you do an attack check, you include the strength of active reserve units that could be placed in a hex adjacent to the target. And uh, it has to be a hex from which you know, they, they could they could trace supply. So an active unit is proximate to. So I'm gonna bring this unit over from the reserve box to demonstrate that the unit could be placed adjacent to the defending hex. It could be placed in this hex. Uh, this hex has four steps in it, and this is a two-step unit. So it could potentially be placed. It hasn't been placed yet. We're just doing an attack check. I'm going to stick it over here just so we can refer to it. But what it means is that its strength can be counted in the calculation to see if there's an attack. So our strength is 8 and 4 is, is 12. And the German strength is 4. However, the German is adjacent to another supply German unit here. So its strength for the purposes of this check only is increased by one to five. So that means we don't have a three to one, we have a two to one. The three to one would be an automatic attack, but if it's two to one, we have to check tactical value to see if it's worth doing. So going through that, I'll do it quicker this time. We get three tactical points for the command value of the activating card, which is three. We get two tactical points because the situational strength is two to one, so that's five. The artillery bonus, barrage bonus applies, so that's six. The attack is in Soviet support, so that's seven. So right there, there's a couple more, but we hit seven, so that means we will be attacking. So the attack is going to take place, and we then conduct the combat procedure for a Soviet attack. The first step being add active reserve units. So we're going to add this unit, and the requirement is that it be able to be placed in a hex that's adjacent to the units under attack, and it's a hex that one of the active units has enough movement points to reach legally. It could be placed here because one of these units could legally go one, one, two, three, sorry, four into there. Uh, disregarding the overstack, it's still able to reach it. It cannot be placed here because 
a Soviet Union can't move there due to SOX, can't be placed here because likewise, a Soviet Union cannot, that an active so well, he can't even reach it for movement points. So the only place that could be placed is here and that's legal, so it is placed there. So that gives the, the Soviets three attacking units. We then draw a card to see if there's a combat tactic applied. And so we draw this card. Oh, yeah, bring it over here. It has the combat tactic of NKVD, which is going to automatically add a hit if we draw, I think, at least five chits, if the Soviets do, that is. However, there are some chits that are bad for NKVD, so this is this has its pluses and minus. But anyway, that's that's a applicable combat tactic as a result of this card. So that will count. Oh, and we would check to see if the auxiliary card had a combat tactic, but there is no auxiliary card. When you move an auxiliary card over to be active, you don't put another auxiliary card out. Uh, it's on its own. The Germans will decline to play a combat tactic. So now we're going to draw combat chits. Uh, we have two units of three steps each attacking. So that's going to be four chits right there. The reserve unit makes it five. The artillery barrage zone makes it six. And our combat tactic of NKVD makes it seven uh, chit draws. Let me just read the NKVD impact on the combat. That is increase hits incurred by the defender by one, but there are some NKVD combat chits that also will apply and they might not be good. Okay, so now we're going to draw seven combat chits. These all stay out of the cup because a, a chit to replenish the cup didn't come up. All right, now we're drawing seven chits. And remember, the Soviets always draw their maximum. There they are. Okay, uh, the first one, if the attacker command value is three, four, or five, it's a D1. Looking at the Activating card, it has a command value of three. So this counts, although let's look at the flip side. If the attacker command was one, it would be a hit against the attacker, but that's not the case. So it's this one. Seven to one, I know we don't have seven to one now. We have a 12 for our strength and a four for the defender. So it's just a three to one. So that doesn't count. And it is not a flank attack. If we were attacking from a third hex or from two hexes that weren't adjacent to each other, it would be a flank attack. So that does not apply. Okay, and here's another one that says flank attack. Uh, it's also, so it's not a flank attack. It's not a one hex attack. It's not uh, in a city. So that doesn't apply. Well, the flip of this was, oh, right, seven to one. The next chit says German air power there was no air power tactic or the Soviets not supported. The Soviets are always in support early in the game. And flip that, no Soviet air power. Attack or command value of four or five? No, we determined we were a three, so this does not apply. Flip it, the defender is not dispersed or unsupplied, so that doesn't apply. So two to one, it is a two to one or greater and it is not less than 1.5 to 1. So that applies. City Woods, the defender is in clear terrain and clear. Oh, that's bad for the attacker. Okay, so our result for this attack was A1, D2. Because of the NKVD combat tactic, it's A1, D3. So our, this, the defending units have a, a two units with a total of three steps. So as the German player, I decide how to apply three hits to these defenders. So I'm going to apply one by flipping, by reducing the two step to one step, and then I'll retreat two hexes. And I will go, I think I'll go straight back. 
And because I retreated two hexes, I need to disperse. So they both get a disperse marker. And then the attackers now need to satisfy their hit. They got an A1. First hit against the attacker is always taken as a step loss. The priorities for applying step losses are that it has to be to unit with the most steps. If tied, then with the highest selector number among those units. So we have these two units with three steps each. The one with the higher selector number has a selector of 03. So we will apply the step loss to it. And then there's an opportunity for advance after combat. At the moment, the unit with the lowest selector is unit 02. And looking in this hex does have, it has a secondary advance arrow, which is one of the advanced priorities. It's not a VP hex, it's not in primary direction, but it is in a secondary direction. So that, and since the hex is empty, that's an automatic advance. So he goes there. Then the next one to check for advance would be unit 04. And that's a primary advance, but since there's a unit in the hex, a roll will be made to see if he advances. This time, yes. So he advances to there. And then once a hex has two units advanced into it, no one else advances. It would be a different case if, if there were mechanized units that could advance two hexes, but so far all of our advances have been by infantry, by the Soviets. Okay, so that was that attack. We discard the combat card that was drawn. Then we look at the rest of our activation steps to see if there's anything else to do. There's no more reserve units that might enter. Every unit either moved or attacked. So no one goes to reserve, no IPs are placed, and no units have dispersed markers. So that's the end of that activation. So we discard this card. Oh, in our attack, we did draw a, a colored combat chits, so we're going to return all combat chits to the cup. Now the Soviet turn really is over because there's no cards in the, no command cards in the auxiliary card box or, or the, the primary command. So that's all done. So now it's back to the German turn. We're going to pull back. We're going to activate our 48th Panzer Corps and move them back so that they're no longer in the artillery zone. I'm talking about these three guys here. They're part of 48th Panzer Corps because they're, they're next to this, this very large formation here, the uh, third tank army. And when they activate, they can be brutal. So we're going to fall back some. We're going to take him one, two, Three, four, five. One, two, three, four. And one, two, three, four, five. Now their artillery can't hit us anymore. So that was our activation. So we discard that. Now it's back to the Soviets. Again, we draw two cards for them. And the cards we draw this time are going to be Stavka, oh, that's their big card. And the second card we're drawing is 69th Army. So we have to determine which of these is going to be the command card to start. And neither of them are primary. They don't say primary at the bottom. If they're both primary or neither are primary, then you look at their command value. And Stavka has a command value of five, whereas Verona's front is only a three. So Stavka will be our primary card. And that will mean we put 69th Army into the auxiliary box. But before we do, let's just check to see if it has a, has a command event, because if it did, it would be done now. It has a special event that's valid on turn one, but that's not a command event, so that doesn't happen. And it's other command event only starts on turn five. So there's no event. So it does stay in the auxiliary box for possible use later. 
So Stavka is our card, and Stavka has specific instructions by game turn. On turn one or three, we're in turn one, you activate all units in mobile group Popov plus stacked units. Looking at that situation, a mobile group Popov is in this area here. These two units, these two units, the two units under this green one. Because it's Stavka, stacked units are also activated. So these three units are going to be active. And over here, here's another Popov unit stacked with a Sixth Army unit. So they're both activated. And then this Popov unit here. So that's a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten units being activated. So this is a, a large activation. So we start by checking to see if any units in the front, which is the southwest front, are able to reach the objective marker in a single move. But that still cannot be done. There are German Zocks running all the way through here. So the Southwest Front objective is not reachable at the moment. So we don't move the objective marker. So now we go on to moving active units. The first movement method is to check if any units can take a VP hex, a German VP hex. That means to enter a German VP hex. But there are none that are reachable that could actually be entered. Then adjacent to a German VP hex and closer to the objective or within four hexes of the objective. The only German VP hex in the area is this one. And all these Soviet units, with the possible exception of him, are already closer to the objective. So they're not going to go back to Slavyansk. That, that's, that's what's happening there. Now, uh, let's just count the hexes to make sure. One, two, three, four, five, six to here from the objective. And this guy is, these guys, for example, are one, two, three, four, five, six away. So a move over there would not be closer. These guys could actually get closer by moving here, but they don't have enough movement points to reach it. So that's not possible anyway. Third is to open a supply line, but the Soviets don't worry about supply yet. There's a bunch of movement methods that are skipped at this point because mobile group Popov is one of the two spearhead formations in on the Soviet side. Popov and the third tank army over here are spearhead formations. So they skip movement methods that are not about moving forward. We skip methods that the units in Sixth Army earlier were checking, but we skip those and go on to movement method 10 in this list, which is to follow the movement arrows. And this we do in ascending selector order. So we're going to find the lowest numbered unit in mobile group Popov. It looks like it's three here. And we're going to see if this unit can spend an, its entire movement allowance following movement arrows. If it can, it will move by movement arrows. If it can't, it won't move by movement arrows. It won't do a partial move. It will only do a full move. So let's just move him forward and see what would happen. Now, the priority is to follow the larger triangle arrows only using the secondary arrows if you can't move in the primary direction. So if he follows primary arrows, he goes one, two, three, and then hits a Zoc where he has to stop. So that's not going to work. If one route doesn't work, you then kind of back up a hex and see if something else can happen. So he started here. So this is one, two, there's a secondary movement arrow here. It costs him two to cross this river. So this would be three more. That would take him five to there, which is still not his full movement allowance. So he won't do that either. Then 
going back even a hex further and checking the alternative, he could go one, two, that won't work, he hits a Zoc. And then finally, yes, there's a minor arrow here. So he could go one, oops, then there's a, a primary arrow under there, two, and then another primary arrow, three, but that gets him into his ox, so that doesn't work. But there's one more option. He could go one, and then he could follow the secondary arrow, two, then back to a primary arrow, three, and then four, five, six. So it turns out he does go there because there was a way to get their falling movement arrows. Okay, so his move is done. Let's check unit four. I think we can tell that he's not going to be able to go anywhere because he's even closer to this stuff. I mean, this would be one, two, three, four, five, and stop. So he can't he can't go by movement arrows. Uh, next would be six. He can probably do what his friend did, the same route. Yes, of course. He was in the same hex, so he would follow the same. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. Then the next we have is nine. He could go one, two, three, four. No. One, two, three, four, five. No. One, two, three, four. No. One, two, three. No, there's no, these two can't move by arrows. The last one possibly to check is here. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't check seven, but he, he his movement arrows don't allow him to even get started. 19, one, two, one, two, three, four, no. So that's it. So those, we were able to move two guys by movement arrows. Everything else is a little too constricted. Oh, actually I'm wrong. Of course, I made a mistake. The, this river here costs two to cross. So the nine unit, could go one, two, three, four, five, six, and this guy will follow suit. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so we've moved four of our units so far. This guy, seven, one, two, three, four, and that's not an overstack. Our little one step guy, little one step guy can go one, two, it's only one for him to cross the river, three, four, and then. Everything else is an overstack. So we have four units that haven't moved yet. Here, 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 and here. The next movement method is just closest to front objective. So regardless of road net, this, this is just trying to get as close to the front objective as you can. Here's our front objective. So this is also in ascending to numerical order of units that haven't yet moved. So starting with unit four, if you had enough movement points, this would be the closest, but that would cost seven movement points to reach. So that's not going to happen, but could get three away. Uh, this is three away. This is three away, but those are already fully stacked. So that's not possible. This is three away and reachable. This is three away, but not reachable due to river and Zox. So 
he goes one, two, three, four, and stops there, three away from the objective. Then unit five wants to get as close as possible also, and I think we'll end up in the same space. This would be one, same hex, one, two, three. Now his infantry is only one to cross the river, but even to get there would be five, so he has to stop there. That's three away. If he could, the reason he, this would be preferred, even though three away, is that it's further west. When, when you're tied for equal distance from the objective, you then look at the objective's compass direction, which is west, and this hex is further west than that hex. Remember, west is down. Next would be this unit. Can he get closer to the objective? He can get can't get within three because this would then be an overstack. He can't get there. He can't get over here. That's an overstack. So he could, he's five away now. So we could get four away. So he could. This is four away. This is four away. This is four away. So he wants to choose between one of these four hexes. So the uh, priorities say closest to objective, among those adjacent to a German occupied hex with the least strength. Of those hexes, the only one that's adjacent to a German occupied hex is this one. So that's where he'll go. He goes like that. Then this is the only guy that hasn't moved yet. He can't get within three for the same reasons as the other. So he wants to get within four and in this case he can get next to he can get here that's four away and is adjacent to a german occupied hex and with the least strength this guy has a strength of three he had a strength of four over here so he goes there all right so now everyone has moved several of them ended up adjacent to enemy units. So the next step is to do attack checks. Now this Stavka card says all in support attacks receive the NKVD combat tactic. So that will be helpful if we attack. Let's do the attack check for beginning with the lowest numbered selector unit adjacent to a German unit. That would be this guy in this stack is a three. So we'll do this check first. We're going to add up the strength of all the active units adjacent to this potential attack target. We have 10 here and we have 10 here. That's 20. The German unit is a four and if there are adjustments to its strength, uh, not in a group position, not adjacent to another German unit, not all attackers are across a river. If all the attackers were across this river, his strength would be considered five for the attack check only. Germans aren't dispersed or out of supply. So it's a five to one. So the attack occurs. Anything three to one or higher automatically occurs. So this attack will be conducted, Stavka, is the activating card so we will automatically get this nkvd combat tactic and then we draw to see if we get another combat tactic and we draw this card 69th army assault coordination okay so that tactic will do the following in a Soviet attack, all non-active Soviet units adjacent to the defender's hex participate in the attack. Well, they're all active and participating anyway. So that doesn't happen. Then it says, if no units are added via assault coordination, instead add two combat ship draws for this combat instead of one, which you would normally do, and reduce the attacker hits by one. So that will help the Soviets that way. Then we also check 
the auxiliary car to see if it has a combat tactic that is different from all the others. And it has an air power tactic, so it is going to be used. So this will make this attack very strong, but then there won't be an auxiliary card for a second activation. So in this case, we have the Stavka activated attack that's going to have an NKVD combat tactic and assault coordination and air power. So the Germans are looking at this and saying, you know, if that guy gets wiped out, that is a huge hole. So I think I'm going to have to use a card in a, as a combat tactic. So I'm going to play this card as artillery. Hopefully we'll get a lot of artillery chits in this attack. So now we calculate how many chit draws the Soviets get. They get three for these guys. They get four for these guys, that's seven. Then they get NKVD for eight. They get two for assault coordination, so that's 10. And then they get one for air power, that's 11. That's a lot of chit draws, okay. Let's draw 11 and see what happens. Okay, first one is city or attack not supported, doesn't apply, clear, that's an A1D1, okay. Oh, here's an artillery. Now the Germans played artillery, the Soviets didn't. So this will hurt the Soviets. Here's one that's only attacker armor, but in this case, I think both sides have armor, yes. So this will not apply. Here's another clear, wow. All right, this is bloody. So far, it's an A3D2. Let's see, is defender dispersed? No. Is defender adjacent? No. Is defender, there's another defender dispersed or defender adjacent, so that doesn't apply. Here's a city town. No, flip is an, another clear terrain. Here's another dispersed unsupplied. Flip, defender adjacent, no. City, town, woods, no. Dispersed or unsupplied, no. Very unusual chips this time. 1x attack, no. City, no. Flank attack, no. And finally, flank attack, no. 1x attack, no. So we got a A3D3. Now, the NKVD adds a hit, so it's an A3D4. The assault coordination, I think, removes a hit from the attacker. Yes, yeah, so now the net is an A2D4. So the German unit is going to be eliminated because it can absorb two hits by retreating, but then it has to take two hits for its steps. So it is eliminated. And then the defender, after all this, has to take two hits. The first hit is applied to the, a large unit, and there's only one large three-step unit. So this unit takes a step loss. And then uh, we check to see how the second step is applied, whether they're going to take a step loss or have everyone disperse. Given the way the chart works, I'm sure it will say that they will take the step loss. We look at a chart that has a number of attacker steps and the number of hits remaining. There's one hit remaining to be applied, and at the moment, the attackers possess 11 steps. So yes, it is taken as a, a step loss, and it's applied by the same parameter, the largest step unit and then among those, the higher selector, but a unit can't take more than one step loss in a given attack. So the highest two-step unit, highest selector is the pop of 11. So it takes a step loss and then they can advance. So now we have a very open advance situation, although the ones advancing across the river will be limited in what they they'll only be able to advance one hex per the advance rules. 
So our lowest numbered selector checks for advance first. That's going to be the six here. The first text of advance is by primary route and closer to objective. So that's automatic. And since he can advance two hexes, he will continue to follow the primary advance route to there. So that's his advance. Then we check the next lowest numbered unit, which is this infantry unit. It is not entering a VP hex. It is not. No, there's no movement arrow going that way. It is across a river and closer to objective. So that's a, a primary reason for advancing. So it will advance. Okay, then the next number is nine. So he would also advance because it's uh, across a river and closer to objective. There's already a unit there. So he rolls to see if he advances and he does. And now that this hex is occupied by two units, no more units will advance into it. So that's the end of the advance after combat. This mech unit could not advance a second hex because if you advance across a river as your first hex of advance, you must stop. All right, so that first attack blew a big hole open. Then we're discarding the tactic cards played. The Germans discard this card. The Soviets discard this card. Now this combat card here would be discarded, except it says reuse. If drawn during combat or applied as a combat tactic, shuffle this card back into the draw pile. Don't reuse on a mud turn or when only three or fewer cards are in the draw pile. So I'm going to put him back into the deck. Now, we still have other units to check for attack. Number 19 here and number 7 here. Okay, so 7 is, is lower selector. So he, we check to see if he will attack this guy. So the strength is 4 and the defending strength is 4. But they're in an IP, so their strength is a 5. The situational strength comparison is is less than one to one, four to five. And if that's the case, you don't even check tactical value. So that attack doesn't happen. Over here, our German unit is a three and it's dispersed. So uh, because it's dispersed for the purposes of checking situational strength, its strength is reduced by one to a two. So in the comparison, it's a 3 to 2 or a 1.5 to 1. So then it's worth checking the tactical value of the attack. Now our activating card is Stavka. So that's a 5 right there. Situational strength is not equal to a greater than 2 to 1. But the artillery bonus still applies. That German unit is still in the artillery barrage zone. So that's 6. The attacks in Soviet support. So that's a seven. So the attack will occur. Uh, this unit is attacking this unit. Uh, so now we go to the attack procedure. There are no reserve units to add to the attack. Uh, we draw a Soviet card for a combat tactic. Uh, that is always the case. Okay. So we're adding a fixed artillery, which all that's going to do is an additional chip draw because there is already artillery in the combat. And there is no card in the auxiliary box to be added. So this is the extent of the Soviet tactics. The Germans will decline to play a card. So now we draw combat chits. We're going to still get the NKVD combat tactic and the artillery barrage zone tactic and a draw for this card, even though its tactic is redundant. So our total chip draws are one for our unit, two for NKVD, three for artillery barrage, and combat tactic, one for, so that's total of four. The dispersal will reduce attacker hits by one if we get any. All right, so let's draw the combat chips here. We're drawing four. Ah. Our defender is dispersed or unsupplied. So that applies. 
It is not an eight to one. It is not a six to one. There is no German air power. There is no Soviet air power. It is not a five to one. It is less than a three to one. However, that A to one is canceled out by the A minus one. So the net is just a D one. So the Germans have, oh wait, it was NKVD. So that adds a hit, sorry. So it's D two. When you're dispersed, you can only retreat one hex. So I will do that. This is the only hex I could retreat to. And then I must satisfy the other, the other hit by taking a step. Boom. And still dispersed. Let me set that up there. This pop off unit could advance, but checking the advanced priorities, it's not a VPX, not a primary direction. It's not across a river. It's not in a secondary direction. It doesn't cause surround. It's not close to the objective. It is the attacked hex, so he has a chance of advancing on a die roll of less than seven, but he rolled an eight, so he will not advance into the hex. Okay, close that out, discard this tactic card, and now that we have done all our attacks with Stavka, except I don't think anything else will happen this activation. There is no active reserve units to bring in or to and the, everyone either moved or attacked so there's no moving units to reserve no ip placement and no one was dispersed on the soviet side so the stavka activation is over that's discarded it's now the german turn and the situation here looks dangerous let's zoom out for a slightly larger view there is a gap from here to here with no German units. It is time to bring in some more German units. We're going to play our second SS card for the command deploy all second SS Panzer Corps reserves. And there are four of them here, I just pulled them onto the map and I'm going to deploy them. The deployment rules are the same as in the two player game. For the Germans, I have to be within three hexes of another unit in the same core. If there aren't any yet on the map, within three hexes of another German unit in the same army. And I must be at least three hexes away from a Soviet unit. Uh, alternately, I can just deploy at least five hexes away from a Soviet unit, regardless of proximity to other German units. Now, there are the army areas that the Germans need to follow when they're deploying. There's this line here and this line here. I have to be between those lines in my deployment that it has no effect on movement after deployment. I'm going to put one guy way back here in the Nepropetrovsk. That's a big VP hex. And I found that if a hole busts open or can't be plugged, sometimes the Soviets can get down there very quickly. So I'm going to just play it safe by doing that. So we are deploying the, the three remaining second SS units. And we have a German unit in the same army here. So we can deploy within, and also here, we can deploy within three hexes of that. So we're going to put one of the guys, deploy a guy here. That's at least three hexes away from the Soviets and within three of another German unit, the same army. We're going to put one here. And we're going to put one here. All right, we can't get any closer to the, we could put it here, but I think I'd rather be here. And we can't go south of uh, this line. All right, so that's how I've deployed my second SS Panzer Corps in a desperate attempt to try to reform a line. So we discard that. Next to Soviet card pulls, 
our 40th Army primary and the 69th Army units. So the primary card is going to be our command card. The primary always is picked over non-primary. But before we put this auxiliary card in the auxiliary box, we take a look to see if it has an event that is active. And it does. On turns one through five, it has an event of command delay. Command delay just puts that card back into the deck. So it won't be used for a tactic or anything else This in this impulse. If this card is the current auxiliary card and there are four or more cards in the Soviet draw pile, which there still are, we return the card to the draw pile and shuffle. I'm going to do that. So we'll be activating 40th Army. We've activated them once before. They are Now they have a little more mobility. They are over here. Let me... Uh, okay, so there are three units in 40th Army, and they have their own objective marker, as I mentioned earlier. And they can't yet reach that objective marker. There are still German units in the way, so that will not be adjusted. Uh, they will go through the movement methods to start their activation. They have There's no VPX they can actually take. They can't move adjacent to a VPX. The next method is to move adjacent to a German unit. It has to be an unoccupied hex adjacent to a German unit and not adjacent to a Soviet unit adjacent to the same German unit. And these are done in descending order. So we have a two, a four, and a nine. The nine will move first. And we'll look to see if it can move adjacent to a German unit and not adjacent to a Soviet unit adjacent to that same unit. This hex is adjacent to a Soviet unit. This hex is adjacent to a Soviet unit. But these two hexes, which it could reach, I'm talking about this unit here, are both adjacent to a German unit to which no other Soviet units are adjacent. So it would move over here and it would use the priorities to pick between those two hexes. Those priorities don't settle it. So we go look at tiebreakers closest to units, the unit's objective marker. So its objective marker is here. So this hex, one, two, three, four. This is closest, closer to the objective marker than this hex. So that's where that unit moves to by movement method. The other units can't move by that, that movement method because the only other hex he could reach would be here, and that doesn't fulfill the requirements of the movement method. So there is no hex that's adjacent to a German unit, but not adjacent to, to a Soviet unit or its hex. So now the next method is to move toward the German unit closest to the active army objective. So the German unit closest to this objective is this unit. It's four away. So we want to try to get us these guys as close as possible to this guy, but they can't get any closer than two away. So that is not going to happen. And then finally, the last movement method for units with this army objective are just to move closer to the front objective which is over here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. This is six away. This is six away. This is six away. And this is in ascending order. So unit two goes one, two, three, four. It prefers this hex because if you're moving, if you're ending your move adjacent to an enemy unit, you want to try to go to an empty hex. So he only goes there. And then this guy, moving by the same method to get as close as possible to the front objective, will move to either of these. And since they're both already friendly occupied, when you're moving closer to a front objective, the tiebreaker is that compass direction of west. So this hex is a little further west than that hex. So that's where he goes. So they've all moved, definitely changed direction to take on this armor unit. So now that they're done moving, we check, we do an attack check for them. And they have a strength of 11. Where's our card? 
that a little closer. All right. So their strength is 11 and the armor unit is a four. So that's not quite a three to one. For the situational strength, there are no adjustments. So it's still not quite a three to one. So we have to do a tactical value calculation. Uh, the command value of the card is a two. Situational strength ratio is at least two to one. So that makes it a four. That is the tactical values of four. The artillery barrage bonus does not apply. He got out of there. It is in Soviet support, so that's a five. The Soviet units don't have armor. The attacking units aren't surrounded. They won't be flanked. It's not a VP hex. It says if all combat tactics on the auxiliary card apply to the attack, there is no card. Sorry, I'm zooming around, but there's no card in the uh, auxiliary box. So we only got up to a five, so there will not be an attack. So then moving on, there's no other reserve units to bring in. Everyone did move, so there's no moving units to reserve or placing IPs. So that is the end of the 40th Army activation. We discard this. And so the Germans are going to play their other second SS card to move the guys in the second SS Panzer Corps. We're going to move him there. In there. And in there. Okay. Moving them up. Discarding that card. Now it's the Soviets again. And we're going to we're pulling two cards again. This is the second card. The third tank army is the primary, so they're finally going to get moving. The auxiliary card has no event that is valid on this game turn, so it will go into the auxiliary box. So third tank army moving, they are one of the spearhead formations. Their first movement method is to take a VP hex if they can. They cannot, a German VP hex, they cannot. They can't move adjacent to a German VP hex that's closer to their objective. Their objective is here. Well, there's no supply lines to open. Since they're spearheads, they skip several movement methods and go straight to following movement arrows. So let's see if any of the units do that. The lowest, starting with the lowest numbered selector. Okay, he can go one, two, three, because of the river, four, five, six. So he does that. That's unit oh, 01. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then he could do the same one two, three, four, five, six. Now, this is a situation where a unit is moving adjacent to an enemy unit. And when that happens, you always check for preferred hexes and they override whatever the instructions were in the movement method. So they spent six movement points and were able to reach a German unit, but is that the preferred hex they could have gotten to if they were just moving? The preferred hex when moving adjacent to an enemy unit is one that causes surround of that unit. First of all, there are none in Soviet support. Yes, not adjacent to another Soviet unit. So could he have moved here? Possibly. He started here. So that would be one, one two, three, four, five, six. He could have reached this, so he does move there instead. So again, well, once you're moving adjacent to a German unit, the priorities finding the best hex adjacent to that German unit override the restrictions of that given movement method that, that got him there in the first place. So it overrode the restrictions of following movement arrows. All right. So that was unit one, unit four, unit three, we determined couldn't move. So on to unit five. One, two, 
already know. Unit six, for the same reason that unit three couldn't move, unit six can't. Unit eight, one, that's here. He could go one, two, but then has to stop, so he doesn't move by this method. Unit nine, one, two, three. He does move because he can go straight ahead. One, two, three, four. And again, ending adjacent to a German unit means that his move may be adjusted. And following the priorities, he wants to end up. There's not a hex that's not adjacent to another Soviet unit, but the next uh, priority is that the hex be empty. So he's going to go there. So that's where he ends his move. He started here and it went one, one, two, three, four. Okay, so that was unit nine. Next would be unit 10. Okay, movement arrow one, two. So he's going to follow movement arrows as well. He starts by going two to there. Uh, he can't go to the, straight to there because that would be Zoc to Zoc. So he goes two to there. Now, there is a restriction here in that this guy, the Soviets will never move in such a way that it causes a surrounded unit to become unsurrounded. So we're going to see if this move will be allowed because right now the unit is still surrounded. That is, there is a Soviet Zoc in every, or unit in every hex around it. But when he moves from here to here, spending two, then he'd go three to here, still all in Zox, and four to here, but then there's no Zoc in this hex. So he would not be allowed oops, to do this move. So he's going to go back to here. That restriction prevents unit 10 from doing that move. And then we're up to unit 15. He can't move by movement arrows. And then we're at unit 24. One, two, three. One, two. So he could actually do one, two, three, four. And here we would check to see if there's a better hex for him to be in, but none of the hexes are, they're already all activated by, I mean, occupied by active units. So there's no adjustment for being adjacent to a enemy unit in this case. Okay, so those are all the units that could move by movement arrows. There are still units remaining to move. The next movement method to check is closest to front objective. Here's our front objective. And we're again checking in ascending numerical order. So we'll go back and start with unit three and one, um, here's our front objective. It looks like this hex is four away, if he could reach that. This hex is four away. Those are the closest. These other hexes are five away. So if he could get to there or there, he would do that. So one, two, three, four. Moving closest to objective would take him here, but the priority is to be adjacent to a German, the German unit with the least strength. So this one here is adjacent to this unit, which has the least strength. So that's where he moves to. Then unit five is next to go. And he could also move adjacent to get to a hex four away, one of these. So he's going to go to the same place because that's adjacent to the German unit with the least strength. Then unit six will also want to get four away. He ends up going here because going there would be an overstack. Then unit eight back here. The hexes that are only four away are now all 
either of those would be an overstack for him, so he will try to go to a hex that's only five away and adjacent to German occupied hex with least strength. So that again is going to be this guy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Or seven. Yes, he could go there. And that's adjacent to the German unit with the least strength and is only four away. So that's what he does. Then unit 10. So his move will be restricted again by needing to keep this guy surrounded. So he couldn't, he can get closer to the objective. So he will work to do so. That one, two, three, he can go there. See, that still keeps this guy surrounded, but does get closer to the objective. If he moved any further or closer to the objective, that German unit here would no longer be surrounded. So he stops there. And then unit 15, can he get closer to objective and still keep him surrounded? Probably not, because this, this hex is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven away from the objective. This hex would be seven away. And so that's not closer. So he's not moving by that method because he can't get closer. So that's it. The other movement method is if you're not adjacent to a German unit, move adjacent. But the only remaining person is adjacent. So that's the end of the moves for third tank army. So now we're going to do attack checks. We start by finding the lowest selector numbered unit, which I believe was the three, right? Oh no, there is a one. There it is. I missed that before as well. Here. So we're going to determine if there will be an attack against this guy for the situational strength check for the attack. We're a 7, 11, and we're an 18. So it's a 3 to 1 already. So that attack will occur. Okay, so now we need to draw a tactic for that event. And we draw this one. Now this card, its combat tactics don't start until turn 2. If you, if you draw a card and it has a combat tactic that doesn't apply, it's you still get one chit draw. So that's all that card will do uh, for, for the Soviet attack. Uh, the auxiliary card is combat engineers, however, and that will help. So that card is taken from the auxiliary box and brought up as a combat tactic. The Germans will not play a card. So the number of chits being drawn by the Soviets for this attack is two, three, four, five, and then six for this unused tactic and seven for combat engineers. Now the combat engineers, if the defender had an IP, it would be removed, but that's not the case. So instead, the combat engineers just increase the attacker's strength by two. And the defender is not allowed to play combat engineers, although we're not doing that. That'll increase the strength by two of the entire tax. So that's, again, seven, 11, 18. Two becomes 20. So it increases the odds to it's 20 to five. So it'll be a four to one odds. And there will be seven chip draws, as we already determined. So let's go ahead and resolve that combat. These are from a previous combat. Drawing seven chits. Okay, so we have combat engineers. There's also some chits that have combat engineers. We'll see if those, those appear. Soviet air power, none. No German air power. Oh, more air power. Okay, that doesn't apply. NKVD. Well, there were situations where that would have applied, but now it doesn't. And it is a five. No, it's only a four to one. So that doesn't apply. Attacker artillery. No one has artillery in this 
because we're outside the barrage zone. So far, nothing's happening in this attack. A six to one, no. A four, there you go, four to one. So that's a D1. All right, so these are counting. Here's a two to one, and it's not a 1.5 to one. So that's two hits. A five to one, no. Three to one, ooh. Wow, there was a sudden surge at the end there. This is an A1. D4. I think this was lucky for the Soviets in this case. A1, D4. Now, the German unit has three steps, so it will barely survive. So let's uh, apply the German hits first. I am enlarging this so we can see. So the Germans take one step loss and take another step loss. Retreat one, and then we'll retreat two and become dispersed. Because that happens when you retreat two. Okay, now the Soviets must take a hit. They had an A1, and it has to come off a large unit if there are the largest unit. Well, there's a lot of two-step units, so then it comes off the unit with the highest selector. So that's going to be this guy here. He will lose a step. And then there's advance after combat. So our starting with the lowest selector or armor unit advances in the direction of the primary arrow. Uh, move this so you can see that there's the primary arrow. And then he, because he's mechanized, he continues to advance in the direction of the primary arrow to there. By the way, some of the arrows are marked V for Voronezh or S for Southwest Front. They only exist if the units of that front are following them. So this S arrow here does not exist for these units there in Voronezh Front. Then the next unit is Unit 4, so it's also following a primary arrow for the first hex of its advance. And then for the second hex, here it has a choice of places to go. So it's going to go to the one where it has the most likely chance of advance because if it's advancing where there's already a unit, it's a, it's a one to six chance of advance. But if it's advancing to a hex, say, that causes surround, it's a one to seven chance that it will try to do. It's going to see if it advances there, but it has to roll a one through seven. It did. So now he has Zox. Soviet Zox, this guy has Soviet Zox all around him. Now the third guy to advance would be him. And this is again the primary direction. And then the second hex would not be here. There's no, there's no priority that would send him in that direction. It's not closer to the objective. There's no direction arrow. It doesn't surround anything. So he will try to continue in the primary direction to here, but has to roll a one through six in order to do so. He does. Okay. Then unit nine advances the primary direction and stops because he's infantry. And then unit 33 will check to see if they advance on a one through six, and they do. So this is a situation at the end of that combat. Okay, the combat chips included colored ones, so they go back into the cup. And that was the first attack, check, and attack. These two cards are discarded because they were combat tactics for that attack, but there's still more attack checks possible. We have the guys in this hex, and the guys in this hex are adjacent to German units, and they're active. So the lowest numbered one is three. Three is adjacent to two German units. So one of those German units needs to be selected. Just checking to see how you decide between units that, uh, when more than one unit is available to be attacked, you go with the strongest attack potential. So it's gonna be an attack against here because that is only a two, and that's a four. And the attack will be this guy and then everyone adjacent. So all three units are attacking this little guy here. 
the Soviet strength is 13. Our strength is just a two and dispersed. It's say uh, the odds start very high. Now, there's if a Soviet attack gets really high, it's called overwhelming. And if it's overwhelming, you don't add tactics to it. So I am going to read you the definition of that. If the ratio is greater than or equal to eight to one, or then it's an overwhelming attack. Or if it's a large attack, that is where at least seven chits will be drawn, and it's six to one, then it's a large attack. In this case, we'd be drawing one, two, three, four, five chits for the units, and one because the artillery barrage is still in effect. Uh, so we don't yet know if it's going to be a large attack. The other is if the defenders are unsupplied or dispersed and the ratio is five to one or greater, then it's considered an overwhelming attack. And that is the case. Uh, we do have better than five to one and a dispersed unit because we're a, we're a six to one. So there will be no combat tactic card draw. And there was just, I was just checking to see if there was anything auxiliary and there wasn't. So we're going to go ahead and do this attack with one, two, three, four, five, six chip draws. The units dispersed, so the Germans can't give it support. Would we say six? We are again a thirteen to two, so it's not a seven to one. It is not quite a large attack. It's not a city. It is not town woods are broken. Oh, this is, will he survive? Well, let's see, large attack. Oh, there's a six to one. Okay, and here's a four to one. Yes. Oh, and here's a 1.5 to one. And here's a four to one. Oh, my. Check the flip on that. Oh, it's a six to one. All right, I think he's quite dead. Yep. The result is an A2D6. And because he's dispersed, that removes a hit against the attacker. So it's uh, a 1d6. The dispersed unit is going to be eliminated easily because if he can only retreat one hex. So he could retreat to here onto a friendly unit, but then the second hit has to be applied by losing its, his step. So he's going to be eliminated. And because he's eliminated with only two hits, the other four defender hits left unfulfilled. So the attacker hits are reduced to zero. So the attackers suffer no losses. Then we check for advance. Here's an advance in a secondary direction. If this unit were to advance a second hex, it would have to be here or here. And that is not a direction that's in any of the advanced priorities. So he stops there. Then unit five, roll to see if he advances. And he does not. And unit eight would not advance backwards. There's already someone in the attack hex, so there's no priority that suggests he would advance there. So that's that attack. And that concludes the attacks for the third tank army because every unit adjacent to a German unit participated in an attack. So this guy should be checked for an attack. So that's going to be, it starts as a one-to-one -one in an improved adjacent to looking for other adjustments. There are no other adjustments, so it's only a one-to-one, -one, so we have to check tactical value. So the command value of the third tank army card is a three. Barrage zone makes it a four. Soviet support makes it a five. There are less than four cards left in the Soviet drop at this point, so that would make it a six, but that's not quite enough for an attack, so that doesn't happen. So that then is the end of that activation. So now we're back to the Germans, and we're almost at the end of the first turn. I think this might be a good place to call it. Yeah, so we're going to stop here. I think this gives you a good idea of the, the range of things the Soviets can do, especially in the early part of the game, and hope this has been helpful. And, uh, you know, any questions? I know Board Game Geek is a great place to, uh, to
get answers. Thank you.